Okay, so real quick, I want to do a video that's going to go over the details of how to create and run C programs. This is going to be pretty introductory. I'm not going to try and do anything super detailed, go into explicit detail on anything, but there are a few things that I want to discuss just starting. Part of that being how to actually run a test and code pretty quickly. We'll have to have an entire development environment set up on your machine. We'll get to that in a later video, but I want to go over some online compilers and whatnot that you can use just today. If you want to write some code, hash it out and just test things. Uh, another one is going to be kind of follow up video, follow up to my previous video. So kind of like a sub part of this video. I'm rambling. I'm sorry. But it's essentially talking about more of the CPU architecture, which is going to tie into actually writing the code today. And then another one is going to be detailing how to, or mostly how it looks running on your local machine. I'm not going to get into the actual setup for local machine, do that again later, just because there's a few hoops and hurdles to deal with that I might do it on operating specific. So if you're on Windows or Mac OS, it's going to be different. But anyway, I'm going to stop rambling and start getting video. Just swap over here and now you can see that I have a web browser open so you're gonna see three windows here you see one that says online GDB one that says program is online C and one that says compiler explorer we're gonna focus on these two first primarily this middle one but these are gonna be the two online C compilers and development environments and I'm gonna suggest early part of the class again we'll get into local environment later which is what we'll transition to when we start doing more complex things. But for now, I'm just going to show online GDB real quick. If we take a look, you'll see that we have this giant comment block up here and then a little bit of actual code. So first things first, I'm going to go up to the top right. Actually, I think it's a bit larger. There we go. So here, next team. So, if we look, we're just gonna get rid of this comment block just because it's just an introductory to online GDB. But what this is, is kind of a text editor where you can like type in some code and we can run it up here, do some debugging and whatnot. I may talk about that in a different video, but for now, we're just gonna look at Ryan's code and then running it. So if we run it now, it's just gonna print hello world. Just like so. Right down this console and we're good to go. So few parts here. This is kind of the basic footprint for any C program we're going to do. I'm just going to get rid of this uh, print F. So we have an include statement. So hash include open bracket, well, angle bracket, and then scd io.h. This is standard input output header file. So this is going to be important library. We'll talk more about header files later as well. We just use them to extend the functionality of our system or not so much our system, but our program at this point. And then we have this line which says int main and then two parentheses. The parentheses are gonna be used in basically every single function. We'll talk more about functions later, but this is basically just our main function, which is going to contain the initial part of our program. So you always have to have a main function. That's where everything starts. And the int part is for integer and that being the type of function this is. So this is an integer main function. So it needs a return type. We we return this to zero. Integer is just like in basic math, they're gonna be non-floating points. So there's no decimal notation or anything like that. And so this is just kind of the basic footprint of a C program. Also, these curly braces are what encapsulate everything in this function. So if we run the main function, everything inside those braces, it was going to run. And this is the final part, which is what returns from the function. So if I were to put anything beyond this, that hello world that we saw earlier, if I were to do this, it doesn't do anything because I have a return statement. That's where the function ends. Now if I put this real quick, at the beginning, here, you can see it runs. No big deal. So, I guess that brings me to our first line of code. Print f, hello world. So this is how 
we print to our console, this is just the most basic form of doing it, which is print F, and then two parentheses, everything encapsulated inside of it, will be printed. At least it's being passed into this print F statement. So everything in the quotation is gonna be a string literal, which is basically just the text that we want to print. So hello world, and then you notice everything here ends in a semicolon, and that is the delimiter in C. And that just means this is the end of this line. So if we do, I don't know, let's do this. Now, how are you? Saying hello to the world and saying, how are you? So you're gonna run that. And you'll notice down here that hello world and how are you being printed on the same line. That's because we don't have any way to say this is a new line. So if we want that, we can just do slash n, which will do hello world and then a new line character. So it's gonna be like hitting enter or something like that. So from that, and now they're on two different lines. If we wanted to say reason, do this, we should get the same result. Because now we're putting the new line character at the start of this string as opposed to the end of this one. So again, not too big of a deal. So let's do something a little bit more complicated. But instead of doing it in longline GDB, let's actually take that previous code we see here. Let's just copy that. Go back over here to programmers. And I'm gonna and make this just a little bit larger. And you see we have some output over here. And then that same setup where we have the include sdi.h, the int main, but you'll notice that the brace is on the same line. The location of braces, parentheses, the angle brackets for the most part, they don't matter too much. So some people put on the same line like you see here. And then you see some people, whoop, had it highlighted, I'm sorry. We'll put it on the next line. There's no technical right or wrong way here to do this as a matter of preference. I typically do it like this. And it's just so the angle brackets line up because eventually you'll start doing some nested stuff where you might have everything kind of nested. You see I have two sets of brackets. You can see the highlight to indicate what the uh, matching frequency is. So if we were to say leave this one out, then this one's just kind of open by itself and we try and run it then you'll see we have some issue here and we'll look into some error statements later but for now let's just get rid of this and just have that over should be fine actually you know just put this back in so int main print f hello world new one character print f how are you run that and we get the same results again we did one in online gdb which is just one online compiler and then we have one for this program is now there are more than these there's just two that i found they're free to use so you don't have to sign up for it you don't have to have like an account pay for it anything like that i know there's one called replit that one needs to log into so i didn't really want to show it because i don't feel like making an account but these should be sufficient for basically everything in the first half of the course not too bad I want to start doing local files and whatnot, then it would probably be better to migrate your development environment from online to your actual physical computer. But I digress. For now, this is fine. So, I think, let me see. I think we'll do everything in online GDB just because I'm not covering up the actual text or anything. It should be okay. And I know the actual compiler that's being used here. I wait, no, I don't. I think I know the compiler's being used here. If I do GCC minus version here, you'll see it says error, error, but then you'll see GCC 12.2.0 and then some information here. This 12.2.0 is kind of important for what I'll talk about later to a degree. I, I don't know what's being run here, but it's not a big deal. But I digress. I do shortcuts. 
You can see some of their shortcuts and whatnot here. It's actually quite a lot. That's actually a lot more gross than I thought it would be. That's pretty cool. Bad gross. I'm pretty sure since GDB is using GCC as the action compiler, and I'll, I'll touch on that a bit more in a second. But let's do, let's do some variables. Okay. If I do int, mm, sum, that is going to create an integer data type. And we're going to name that variable sum. So now we have some, uh, some data that's being stored in memory associated with the name sum. I'm going to set that data to zero. Typically, if you're going to do stuff like this, when you start making any variables, you typically want to have something set as a default. That way, if you try to access it later, it's not accessing some null unset data or unassigned data. It can cause some finicky issues later. So be careful on that. I always just do my integers to zero. If I were to do a flow, it'd be like 0, 0.0, but I digress. For now, let's just do sum equals five plus six and you know what? let's just run that I run that nothing happens something happened but in terms of our actual printed out display nothing's there so that's because we didn't tell it to print anything so if I do f sum that should work right right well not quite let's take a look at this we have some error statement I'm gonna I can see the entire thing. So in function main, we have main C9 colon 12, which is telling me on line nine, there's some issue. The warning pass argument one of print F makes pointer from integer without a cast. And it's pointing up to the sum saying, hey, this is an integer. And this print F statement that you see here, and that's true. So they're saying, hey, this is an integer, we can't do this. We have another one here. Expected const char uh, asterisk restrict with arguments of type int. So it's saying, hey, I'm expecting a different type here, but I got this type instead. What's up? Warning format, not a string literal and no format arguments. So it's saying, basically deduce what we can tell with this is that we need a string literal in print F and that should be good but I want to print out this integer that I just made. So we can do that, but real quick, we need a string literal, which is going to be what's encapsulated in these quotation marks. So if I want to actually put that variable in my print statement, what I need to do is use this placeholder, percent %d, that's me saying, hey, I have some integer data type that's going to be placeholder here. I need a parameter that's going to be passed to it to say what this is. So I'm just going to do this. I'm going to actually make the new line character just because. And then I'm going to put a comma after that quotation mark. That's going to start my parameters. I'm just going to put some here and run it. And just like that, we have 11 with sum equals 5 plus 6. And I'm passing sum into this percent %d placeholder in my string for print f. We're all good. So if we want to do something a little bit more complex, we'll do in term one. And I'll just make that five. In term two equals six. Now I'm going to get rid of some this time. And I want to print out some of these. But I want to do it with some actual text. So the sum of percent %d, percent %d is percent %d with a new line character. So now I have three of these integer placeholders that you see. And so I need a list of three of these in my parameters. So I have sum one, well, term one, not bad, term two. And so now I can say the sum of term one, which is five, and term two, which is six, should be, well, I can determine that this should be the sum, so I need five plus six. Now, I don't, I could just make a sum and sum variable like I did previously and do it, 
or I need something like so. And that, and the sum of five and six is 11. So this is a way we can do something with some basic data types like these integers here and print them and understand how these parameters work in this printf statement. So this is very, very basic C. Now what we'll do is something a little bit more appropriate for math, I guess. So let's do, ask some code over here on the side and when we read, if you see me look over to the right, that's me why, so let's do this. And I'm just gonna do X. Um, well, let's just do six. Y equals 12. And parameter zero and area equals zero. So my default values are here. So everything has assigned data to it, so we should be fine there. So I do parameter equals two times x plus two times y, and that was semicolon. So what I'm saying here is that the perimeter, I'm doing a rectangle, by the way. So let's just do a comment here. So rectangle, oops. So basically rectangle perimeter. So this is a comment. It's not gonna be read by the compiler or any code. It's just a way that you can document your code and see exactly what's happening. So if you're curious when you read it back later, like why did I do this? What's going on here? You read these comments, be like, oh, okay, that's what I was doing. So it's good for code readability for yourself and for anybody else that happens to read your code. Now there is a such thing as doing too many comments and unhelpful comments. So it's gonna be a balance of what is actually useful information in regards to readability of the code. And that's something you learn with practice and expertise because even if you've been doing this for a long time, you can you can either not write up comments or write too many comments that are just overwhelming. So it's finding a good balance between the two. In a lot of different places you'll end up working if you do any coding professionally, they'll typically have a standard of what they want and if they don't, then you can find some online to have a decent guiding point. But I digress. What's happening here is we have two sides. So we have rectangles, we have side one to be six, next one's to be 12. So to get the perimeter, we need two of each, so two times X plus two times Y should get the perimeter of the rectangle. And then if I want the, oops, in my area, The auto Dylan is telling me right now. Area equals x times y. So multiply one side by the other, and there we go. We should be good there. So if I do print f the rectangle has a order of percent d slash n that I want perimeter. and then another one here I'm going to minimize this a little bit stretch it down there we go rectangle has an area of percent d slash n area oh Quotation mark needs to be right here. Okay, so let's take a look. We have obviously our scdio.h, that's our standard library right there, not a big deal. We have two sides, x and y, 6 and 12. We have the defaults of perimeter being zero and area being zero. Then we set them to what they actually should be. And then we print out the actual data. So we run that. The rectangle has a perimeter of 36. We have six plus six, that's 12. 12 times three, because we have two 12s is 24, plus 12 is 36, that's good. And then six times 12 is 72. So we have a way of getting the rectangle's perimeter and also the rectangle's area. So we're all good, not too bad. Okay, so again, if I wanted to, I can paste this. 
and pop it over here. Put that in there. I know I'm covering it up, but it's the exact same code. If I run it, then I get the exact same result. Now, what I want to do real quick is let me see. Okay. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to put a terminal on my local machine. Okay. I'm just going to do, um, yeah, let's see. I'm just going to copy paste that exact same code into my terminal here. So you can see that I have all the exact same code, include SCIFH, int main, x equals 6, y equals 12, from 0, every 0, same exact stuff I just had. Again, I'm covering up some of it, so I digress. Actually, you know what? Maybe that's a little bit better to see it now. Okay, that should be good. So save it, this. So this would be how you run it on an actual local machine. So you can see, I have it, if I were to The actual code is there, not a big deal. Now, the way that you run a deal with C code specifically is you compile it. So this is going to allude back to my previous discussion where we had CPU architectures and C being a high level language. So the reason that that works is we have C and we have the actual code that was being written see it kind of right here behind me so I write that anywhere and it should work especially at that simplified version of C nothing complex is happening nothing operating operator specific architecture specific is happening it's just some variable assignments and some print statements so if I write it and I compile it on one machine it should be fine if I compile it on a different machine it should be fine if I use one compiler or a different compiler should be the exact same results be okay so assuming we're earlier we have in gcc minus minus version i have 13.1.1 that's just the compiler i have for this specific one and then i have c lang as version you can see that i have a uh, version 15.0.7 you can see its target is x86 64 linux so these are the compilers I have on my system if I wanted to compile this code. Clear, less, could see, and dot C here. Not a big deal. So if I were to do GCC and dot C, and I'm just gonna name it a file doing GCC dot out. And I do myself you can see right here that I have gcc.out and if I do elang of my file minus so and I name it elang.out okay you see that I have gcc.out here and I have clang.out here and what those are are actual executable files so that is the code that I wrote Compile it down into an executable file, just like if you had um, a .exe or actually like an application on your phone or something like that. You click on it, it runs some application. That is the compiled code that needs to actually run. So it's an actual application at that point. It's not just code like you see right over here in the background. This is just code. You can't run it. It's not going to work. It needs to run against something or it needs to be compiled into an actual executable application. But those dot outs that you saw are the actual application. So if I run them, I do this GCC dot out, you can see I get that same result. The rectangle has a parameter of 76, the rectangle has an area of 72. Now, if I were to do ceiling dot out, it was compiled, same code, compiled by a completely different application. One's being done by GCC, the other one is being ceiling. Two different entities made these but it's still compiling C code, the exact same C code. And if I run it, I get the same result because at the end of the day, C is a high level language. 
So whenever I compile it, it doesn't really matter. It should give me the same result. Now, that being said, it brings me to this last one over here, the Compiler Explorer. So if you look over here, um, it's not exactly what I wanted it to be. Okay, so sorry about that. Uh, I had to reset Compiler Explorer here. I had a bit of an issue. So if we look here on the left side, we see some actual C code. So we have an int square, int num, return num times num. I think it might be better. Yeah, okay. I can make that a little larger. Good. But at the end of the day, we have just one line of code, return num times num. So we're getting the square of a number. Now, over here on the right, we have the actual assembly code that would be generated by this C code. So we have the actual thing here, you actually see it highlighting what it would be. So the return num times num is gonna be here, and we have pop return, which would be this last uh, bracket here, or curly race press. But at the end of the day, it's going to show us the actual compiled assembly. So you see it being done by x86, 64, GCC, 13.1. That is the GCC compiler that I had. And if we come here, I can actually look for a C-Lang version. So maybe 15.0.0 or the 16.0. You can see that it also has its own variant. And then I wanna do something real quick. I kind of compare against that x86. You can notice if you look at it, it changes a little bit. So yes, it gives me the same results at a glance, but it is generating unique assembly. So even if your high-level code is compiled on the same machine using different compilers, you could get different results, but you really shouldn't unless you get to some very, very specific nitpicky details. Now, if I went and looked for a completely different architecture, instead of x86, I went for say maybe uh, ARM64, then what I'd get is ARM assembly. But notice the actual C code has not changed at all. So C code is fine different compiler for a different architecture gets completely different assembly but I don't have to change my high level code at all and it's amazing for that reason so if I do this you can see that code that I just had a bit ago and you can see what's going to get generated by the actual assembly code and if this isn't readable over here on the right at all don't worry that's machine code basically so it's not really designed to be readable at all unless you spend a lot of time doing assembly like I do so I can make some hedger tails, but I don't really do a lot of arm assembly. But if we moved it back over to say, you see, there's a lot of compilers by the way. And C is supported on a lot, a lot of different machines. So I need to actually look through a bunch of this. Uh, give me x86, I think that might be the better option. I do x86 MSVC. We have CLang, which is CLang 16.0. Back to x86, you can see we get different assembly, but again, we should end up getting the same result. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit more. We find that GCC. And again, a little different assembly, but at the end of the day, we end up getting the same result. And that's why we do a lot of high level language development as opposed to low level because when you do assembly, it is specific to your CPU architecture. So that being these guys, if you recall, you're writing code specific to that hardware, that particular CPU. But if you do it on high level, like C, C++, um, maybe even Python, then your code is portable. And what I mean by that is if I were to take my code that you see on the left over here, and I write that, I write it on an x86 machine. I can run it through a compiler like I did earlier, and it'll work. That executable will work on that machine in any machine that uses a same architecture. But 
if I want to write for an ARM machine, then I take the same code I write, but I need to compile it for a different architecture. So I might not be able to use the same one I wrote it on, but I can take the code, read it, and then move it to a different machine, compile it there, and I should be fine. So, we good. So that's kind of the benefit of high level language and overall just to kind of dive into the basics of C development. So very, very simple C code and then how to actually compile it, how to run it and maybe one of these online compilers and whatnot. And then kind of a follow up saying the benefits of writing C or any other high level language for that matter. You write the code, it does a thing that you want to do and you don't have to worry really about the hardware and thing. You have to worry about if you have it compiling correctly, but a lot of the legwork is done for you. So, hopefully all this made sense. Hopefully you learned something. I'll see you next video.